Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode. The title of this evening's episode is Without Love the Species Won't Survive. And I want to speak about obstacles and compassionate collective progress. You see, there's a lot of things that human beings can comment on. But when we go to comment on the future, we find ourselves creating probabilities and then entertaining the realism of these probabilities, which I'm in another way saying that we are a creature that uh, after cultivating, accumulating information, (coughs) it organizes this information. The organization of this information becomes the strategy which the mind in some sense projects on the body the strategy that intelligence projects into physical reality now the concept of love is very important because the idea of love is transcendental (coughs) in certain approaches you know i would say it is it, it connects with divinity it is the divine that means this world has been so cruel that anywhere there has been some sort of you know glow of the flame of love in some sense there there has been a sort of divinity in the room because it is easier to break than build and that is the law of nature so <clears throat> the concept is very important but how many types of love are there we have a very incredible lecture by a man named Alan Watts Alan Wilson Watts And Alan Watts, when he speaks about the spectrums, the spectrum of love, I feel it means the totality of conscious engagement with the realm. You can say love is a luxury. It is uh, the sign of the higher dimensions. I will tell you, in any work a person does, whatever significance you give it, you know, if there is no love in the work, there is no freedom. And I would say love in modern times can be translated as the freedom of the world to be itself alongside the freedom of ourself to be itself in the world. And freedom doesn't mean uh, neutralization. It doesn't mean making everything so equal to one another that they don't exist anymore. You know, that's the thing about uh, divinity. The thing about divinity is that in its supremacy, it is not non-dual. In that non-dualness, there is no divine person, there is no divine world, there is no divine invisible force. You know, the whole moment is divine. You know, and I don't know, out of 8 billion human beings on this planet, how many realize that their moment is just here? You know, there is a unique, (coughs) you know, divinity. You know what it is? It's as if love is the space where the greatness of the future kind of is is training to arise you know and you know what's very fascinating i'm sure all human beings seek love and let me tell you why even if there there could be those who are like cruel and hatred has consumed them you know <clears throat> but why people will still seek love because when there is no love there is no community that is just common this is why dictators in history have become powerful but they have also become friendless you know that's the thing about power <clears throat> a reason why i will never go into politics you know Because the more power the person has, the more different than they are, they, they are in some sense. 
And in all movies, in all shows, we see the leader figure be dismissed out of the realm first, you know. And the reason for that is that leadership echoes, you know, it's like a chain of command, you know. And this chain of command echoes on. And if in the chain of command, the command is love, that echoes on. If the command is hate, that echoes on, right? Like in the future, we're going to have cyberspace <clears throat> enter our realm in a very uh, unfamiliar way. So when cyberspace becomes real, and imagine we reach a point where, you know, people are fighting the machines and suddenly there comes a prophet of the cyber era. And in that cyber era, this prophet comes and says, enough for the first time, let our species love its creation do you know and so we will begin treating the machine realm as in some sense our children right this may sound too extreme right now but in a couple hundred years from now i am telling you <clears throat> adopting uh you know uh, ai will not be uncommon people Considering that everybody has a different DNA, different placement into the world story, as the Vedas would say, the great Leela, that means we are in an elemental Shakespearean <coughs> uh, reality, to be honest. And what I mean is that there is theatrics in the work, and the theatrics of self is of self-projection and of other projection. You know, there is this uh, understanding that when two people, let's say person A and B, they communicate to one another, we can say person A communicated to person B, or we can say person A communicated to their representation of person B. What that means is that love is this strange thing where two worlds that don't have access to one another have the illusion of access, do you see? And that illusion of access is like the, one of the most great, I would say, great attempts of humanity towards love, you know? <clears throat> and people are different, you know, based on how you choose to live. If you choose to live more in, in accordance, less with your emotions, I feel more work finds you than love. If you, in some sense, choose to uh, listen to the emotions and the <clears throat> way they are moving the moment, then I would say love becomes like that signal suddenly a person received. There's something clicked, there's something in the moment called them forth, right? <clears throat> ancient yogis they would call them lovers of the unknown in the sense that they were not just not only that they found love in the outer realms with whatever whether it was in some sense the person loved their family or they loved their lover or they loved their garden their tree like the trees the forest nature do you know love can be an ideological conditional thing or that very rare saintly state where they call it unconditional love unconditional love means there is love there regardless of if there is ideology there right <clears throat> you know there's um there's something in life that human beings do not know how to value the whole thing, right? And we don't know whether we should value it based on what we've done or based on how we've done what we've done. You know, we don't know if we should value it in accordance to where it goes. That means what was the meaning of life? It began and then it will end and so we are in the middle and on this roller coaster of an elemental, uh, <coughs> you know, endless landscape. It's as if an infinite illusion is trying to love the void and in doing so, completes. You know, the love that is between people, that is divine. But the love that is between a person and a world, <coughs> I would say is... Uh, is more divinely involved you know i have i have been in nature and there has been times where this is just a habit i've had as a kid that anytime i go to some nature area anytime i see a tree i would always go put my palm on the tree and it would be as if i was visiting an old friend 
do you know there I would say that um, we are guests in this world and with that vision what comes to you is like the privilege it's like a blessing you know the Buddha was like hey folks you know you're born alone you die alone <clears throat> and if there is companionship if there is anything you know in the middle of the journey that is the blessing that is an add-on you know to the to how the system is designed you know You know, to have uh, love means to engage the living divine. That means it will have to do something with the unknown. Because if everything is known, the person has no reason to animate. It is only when there is something unknown and there is room or space to expand. And you know, our species will go on into the future and it will make so many mistakes and all that will be a response, a smart strategy to all the mistakes of the species is in some sense that love to, in some sense, not see what doesn't work and see what works and run towards that. You know, I have seen in Eastern cultures, religious people who have acted in front of others that they love God, you know. I can't tell you how many people uh, on this planet I've heard the sentence, I swear to God, right, as if it's like the ultimate declaration. You know, we can say if a person cannot love themselves, they cannot love others. That means a person can love the world and they can love themselves as the world, but to be able to love a changing self. Be able to love yourself, I would say, is an art. Not everyone is blessed with that privilege, you know. I would say for some psychologies, it is, uh, you know, for some mindsets of human beings, it may be easier to, in some sense, love something outside because we are not the one who carries the burden. But to love that which is within means total acceptance of all as all. It means the moment is complete and for the first time in the lifetime you're noticing it. I would like to read for the audience how love exists in the dictionary. <laughs> For those people who love dictionaries, I'm going to read the definition of love. You know, there's multiple. <coughs> so it's a noun. Who knew love is a noun? This whole time, you know, we're looking for love. It's a noun. <laughs> <coughs> so, an intense feeling of deep affection. A strong feeling of affection and sexual attraction for someone. Affectionate greetings conveyed to someone on one's behalf. A formula for ending an affectionate letter. A personified figure of love often rep represented as Cupid. Two, a great interest and pleasure in something. Three, a person or thing that one loves. A friendly form of address. Four, <coughs> who knew there were, you know, that many dimensions to that. <coughs> So a score of zero evidently in tennis and squash and some other sports is called love. Who knew? You know? So when... <laughs> <clears throat> and it's also a verb. You know, feel deep affection for, feel a deep romantic or sexual attachment to, like or enjoy very much. Yeah, you know, and there's even the concept of the phrase of fall in love. Develop a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. 
Yeah, that's the nature of the mind, by the way, guys, that it, it can fall in love with anything because it is thirsting for novelty. That means people are not aroused by, I, I would say, the familiar. They are aroused by the novel. That, and what I mean by that is just the nature of stimulus. There are some things that happen that they uh, classify into past patterns, and there are some things that happen that are just, <clears throat> I would say, new. It's like something new is like an artwork you've never seen. It's like a world of meaning that is there, but your eyes are finding it for the first time. And you know what I would say love is like in this episode, don't worry folks, I'm going to read a lot of quotes uh, like of people in history who have shared their views on love. But <clears throat> what I want to say is that because I use this um, um, vision, this model, I call it Mr. Within's inner and outer realmism. <clears throat> because I perceive this uh, in every moment, there is an inner realm uh, component and there is an outer realm component. When I look at uh, the concept of in the outer realms, love is compassion. That's the simplest thing. The Dalai, the Dalai Lama was so enlightened that he found out the most important idea to share in the human species on a global platform. That without compassion, we don't want to, it's like we don't want to even see the human being's future. You know how many problems in civilization will go, go away the moment people develop a universal archetype? Do you know it's as if I'm looking at a species and being like, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The universe has always been here and we have emerged from what has always been here. We are the ancient in the eyes of modernity. You know, so all human consciousness is not that we are new to the system per se, but it is just that <clears throat> in the multidimensionality at work, it's as if life is a film and there is a director, you know, there is a sound guy, there is a cameraman, there's various different uh, factors of intelligence keeping this film and the simulation alive. Right now, when I use this concept of the inner outer realm, of course I'm not like I'm not like you know Casanova or Don Juan talking to you. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so it's not that I can. Uh, um, the way I have found the sort of understanding is that there are some moments in life where you find forces that are greater than you. And when you find forces that are greater than you, when you meet the unknown, the edge of the language threshold, and the uncon uh, excuse me, the inevitable, that means there's certain circumstances in life that the way it is designed, it's as if like, what can you do? The show goes on, right? So, so the situation is constantly in flux. <clears throat> now, the way I, I, like I keep trying to want to communicate a sort of union uh, I have found where it was for a second me accepting not the con content inside my moment of awareness, but accepting my whole moment of awareness. It was for, as if the, it's like loving yourself is not caring for an idea of yourself uh, only. It is in some sense uh, recognizing where everything is happening and it's literally an instant noticing. I don't know how to say it. It's as if in an instant can per a person can notice how silent the world is And how from that silence there is an untouchable innocence to life attempting things for the first time. Imagine one day we realize the clouds are speaking a language, you know. That 
the shape of reality is its meaning. You know, there's many things a person can extend their attention to. It's as if we're such a multidimensional being, all of us, that right now as I'm talking, every, every person listening to me, you have your attention literally in, uh, how would I say it, <clears throat> a sort of nebulous totality. So what I mean by this is that, I'll give you an example, I'll use myself as an example. Right now as I'm giving this talk, my attention is on what, you know, what I did earlier today. The attention is on where I am now, the attention is on where I will be, then the attention is on the talk, and then the attention is on where the talk started, where the talk is, where it will go. Do you see? <clears throat> so the attention has literally extended out into various dimensions of perception, and it has in some sense, like uh, Neil was it Neil Louis Armstrong Neil Armstrong <clears throat> where he put the flag on the moon and what does that signify that signifies human intelligence got here right so when we come to knowledge it is not per se how we understand a single design but how we comprehend through a macro angle the rhythm of everything that happens all that I am telling people is that the mind's intelligence is like an eagle the perfect metaphor it can sit on a branch and look at the forest from inside the forest and it can fly into the air and perceive the whole thing now if you have access to two states of consciousness one you become the sky the other you are in some sense on the earth right <clears throat> and so with this sort of uh, I don't want to say calculation but with this sort of attitude that every moment has a simple uh, uh, bunker and a complex ivory tower. Every moment has geometry, geometry connects to the infinite, <coughs> phenomena is interdependently here, that means if there wasn't oxygen here, I wouldn't be able to give the talk if there wasn't oxygen in this planet, right? So the, the atmosphere has to be here in order for me to even, for me to be here right so these are they are not a sort of chronological relationship they are an instantaneous relationship you know and you know what it is <clears throat> this planet of ours is so fascinating that however amount you study it there is the unknown so after a point of the person being like what do i know you know or the person being fascinated to know things then you get to a point where you look at what you don't know So the unknown dimensions of life activate and to find a, a, a sort of unknown love, <clears throat> I'm not talking about how in mythology there's interdimensional relationships like between <clears throat> people and the gods, like the more you go back in history the more you see like human beings even had, you know, relationships, you know, of a sexual nature with gods and like mythological figures and whatever, right? So man has in some sense uh, uh, sought connection and in his attempts of connection he has sprayed <laughs> he has he has thrown his attention into into just various dimensions of meaning right that means that sometimes i'm like why do we have memories of ourselves why are we not just one self rolling out through life in a simplicity why is there the complexity of who i was yesterday who i, who I am today and who i will be why is that complexity overlaid on reality you know for me either the option is to look at this world and perceive a gigantic emptiness that leads to no no fathomable resolution that means there is such an emptiness like one world perspective is like all right it's emptiness what is love like the best way to spend the time no 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 so in the, the analogy like the, my mindset moved on from emptiness into the recognition no something is moving here now what is it that is moving how individual is it how collective is it we have quotes in ancient wisdom i might be able to read some for you today you know 
we have quotes from ancient wisdom even I believe it was Rumi he says lovers uh, never meet they are in each other all along what he means is as if like moments are planted right you know and so there is a sort of cultural romance romanticism you can say and then there is a sort of ancient nature connected romanticism You know, in the future, let's say we find a human being who has fallen in love with a robot. Let's say in the future we find a human being who has fallen in love with like an extraterrestrial. Let's say in the future we see a human being that has fallen in love with like a celestial object. That means a person fell in love with a planet, you know, or with the moon or with the sun, you know. And then let's say the person fell in love with the whole universal sector and the moment you are in love with the universal sector it means you are literally an ocean. So when you exist in your oceanic consciousness and you return back to your personality all you can do is laugh. Life finds a silliness because from the beginning there were hidden roots to it hidden roots in soil that the soil we could see but the roots we could not <clears throat> Time is one of mankind's greatest inventions but at the same time one of mankind's greatest blindfolds blindfold you know We have been, you know, I was uh, looking into this concept of psychology, like, uh, <clears throat> how can I tell you, some people are fascinated by the soul, some people are fascinated by the mind, then they are fascinated by the soul. And I was one of those people who was fascinated by the mind, but when I came to look at the mind, I couldn't find it. That means the mind was a concept, but where are concepts? Right now, uh, I'm speaking and I'm an atomic elemental creature, right, as we all are, right? So atoms are somehow talking, so who is doing the talking, right? What is the inspiration? <clears throat> was this system like it was the world like a seed where the design of its 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 complexity was already there right or are we in the imagination uh, of uh, higher minds which till the end of time will be unfathomable and that's a clue that means the moment time ends the unfathomable is accessible Love can be a simple present. You know, this world is so intense. And so if we had this view that we're on this galactic battlefield, you know, and our species is retaliating against the void, it's as if any time in a battlefield you see your own comrade, the strength of the spirit of the moment amplifies. You know, it's like that scene where uh, 8 billion human beings just, uh, they just see the bigger picture. And you know, there is, you can say artificial love, oh my god, I gotta say this, there's artificial love, and then I would say there's a sort of real love. Right? The real love has, it has become unconditional, meaning it's as if you love an object or a subject or a living being, you know, that means loving an unknown variable. <laughs> Ultimately, we're all loving intelligence, if we consider ourselves as an intelligence in this universal sector, you know. And you know what it is? We are matter that is more, it's not like we're more, <coughs> excuse me, it's not like we're more evolved. It's not like we're more evolved than just animals. It's just that our atomic complexity, the intelligence that our cells carry, You 
you know, sometimes I feel that uh, I am just uh, a background seer of the world. I feel as if I am, I am like, not the sky, but it's as if I am a wind in humanity alongside having a, you know, physical body and existing. I have, I'll be honest, I have experienced in my inner realms uh, conscious projections of parallel reality. What I mean by that is there, <clears throat> I would say, the sort of uh, uh, in, inner realm experiences I've had um, in regards to how, not a higher self but a parallel self is that sometimes I have looked at life and I'm like, okay, chaos and order, like the yin-yang symbol, fit into each other, right? So duality has a very symmetrical geometry to it, <clears throat> you know? I would say that the love that I'm speaking about, which I feel that advanced civilization requires <clears throat> in order to survive, is an outer realm love of, of tolerance, you know, tolerance and efficiency as filters. In the inner realms, it would be tolerance for the depth of innovation. That means it's as if we have this attitude, everything we do, we try to do, go all out, but in some sense, we calculate the consequence of the effort. Because if you don't love your past, you probably hate your present. And if you hate your present, you will hate your future. But if the person realizes the past was just a film that finished, you know, and the final credits were, you know, are like your memories of it now. <laughs> When the past does not exist, <coughs> it can, in a strange way, one can also say it's impossible to love it. <laughs> but when I say love your past, that means love the journey. Because a person is with themselves their whole lifetime, <coughs> but when it comes to living in a world of 8 billion creatures, the complexity of all the psychologies eventually lighting there has to be multi-dimensionality as a backup system to the love that didn't arrive on time that means I predict that in 30 years or maybe earlier or maybe later I'm not sure but I feel I feel exactly maybe in like 40 years exactly <clears throat> you know in 40 years let's say I feel the civilization has a gap it has 40 years to quickly establish, uh, try to interlink language with cyberspace. Uh, sorry, not language with cyberspace, nature, to interlink nature through language with cyberspace. That means imagine in, in, imagine in like, I'm saying in like 40 years plus, even let's say in the future, eventually we were, we're gonna get to a point where cyberspace is gonna consume all our minds. When it does that, the only thing we're gonna regret is how much of nature we did not transport into the cyberspace.
So now on to the cold tunnel. This is one of those podcasts where the speaker is just reading quotes on love, you know, to see how history has uh, loved itself. <laughs> Orson Welles, we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for the moment that we're not alone. Mother Teresa says, Let us always meet each other with smile. Excuse me. Uh, I'll read that again. Let us always meet each other with smile, for the smile is the beginning of love. <clears throat> Oscar Wilde says, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. <laughs> Loretta Young says, love isn't something you find. Love is something that finds you. Yeah, but when it finds you, being open to it, I think, is the crucial thing. I think that's like what the whole species needs training for because it's like 8 billion types of earth are roaming in one earth that is endlessly unknown and so in the unknown like like a species in the dark you know like a tribe creating a great fire you know it's it's like that fire for us is the ideological social construct of life the sociological dimensions, the complexity of society, the contexts that people behave in, move in, communicate in, as if human beings are such fascinating creatures. Every human being is simulating reality. That means from every person's brain, imagine a giant sphere has been projected and that they are the center of the giant sphere and in that sphere is the whole universe contained through the language that they have welcomed, you know? Fred, uh, Ferdinand Foch says the most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire. Victor Hugo says life is the flower for which love is the honey. Francois de la Roche Foucault says true love is like ghosts which everyone talks about and few have seen. <laughs> <coughs> you know, this is something where I would say true love would mean the access of two true selves to the same inner realm. It's as if minds have to be directed the same direction or it's meaningless, you know, the evolution. And the issue is that emotions make us assume the inner realm of each other. Right? Emotions are like the imposter, you know? Or like the untrustworthy friend that never needed to be there. <laughs> David Wilkerson says, love is not only something you feel, it is something you do.
to continue um, this quote tunnel. Khalil Gibran says, Life without love is like a tree without blossoms or fruit. <coughs> Lao Tzu says, Kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profoundness. Kindness in giving creates love. The Dalai Lama, the man of the hour, says love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. <clears throat> this is like a great puzzle. Like, why would a human being on this earth say without love, humanity cannot survive? Because without tolerance, we will never see the completion of any great project. And humanity is the great project, you know. It's actually project humanity. Peter Ustinov says love is an act of endless forgiveness, a tender look which becomes a habit. Eva Gabor says love is a game that two can play and both win. It means I think the honesty of the inner realms, uh, the singularity of vision, that is a rare state. You can say a medita attaining a meditative state is rare, attaining, I think, all, let's say all those people on the planet right now in love, they are in a unique state of consciousness. I wouldn't give it as intense as a psychedelic experience, but <clears throat> I remember Terence McKenna saying those people who were in love and they suddenly stop being in love, they have the symptoms of like, you know, certain drugs, right? So the thing is, is that any sort of detachment from a sort of continuity of vitality, uh, of, depend of, of the dependence of your vitality, suddenly there is like the aftermath, right? So what it is, is how much the attention trusts to be the same moment. I would say that is the sophistication. And so that's why I'm saying the, this whole thing about this uh, kind of, uh, you know, non-human, no, it's not even a humanized thing. That means the moment it goes beyond the human idea, it cannot be perverted. It cannot be uh, manipulated. Do you know, it becomes one, it's, it becomes like a supreme ideal on its own, a dependent ideal. And excuse me, an independent ideal, right? That means an independent ideal means it's like it's like the color blue. It's an idea that is just the, the next wave after the void. says love is above all the gift of oneself uh, mother Teresa says spread love everywhere you go let no one ever come to you without leaving happier Aristotle says love is composed of a single soul inhabiting two bodies oh, okay so I might have been Aristotle not Rumi Martin I think Rumi has something similar though Martin Luther King Jr. says, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Just take that in, guys. The state of love, its karmic reward in samsara is so much more than hate. Why? Because hate is a destructive force, but life is a creative force. The moment that destructive force tries to impinge on the creative freedom, the universe of wars, as if we're inside like as if the whole universe is the body of a higher dimensional being and just any time like something evil happens that's like an infection to the body and the world, like you know an invasion and so the white blood cells in some sense retaliate right so karma and what when i say the lords of karma i'm talking about like the uh, white blood cells of a universal being you know <coughs> Thank you.
Mahatma Gandhi says, where there is love, there is life. Albert Ellis says, the art of love is largely the art of persistence. Reese Witherspoon says, there's no bad consequence to loving fully with all your heart. You always gain by giving love. Plato says, as a response to Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> At the touch of love, everyone becomes a poet. This is so true. Why? Because as, as when one is free in their inner realms, they become playful by nature. You know, because we get bored by the absence of stimulus if we have accelerated the speed of our attention in the realm. Right? So those people drawn to these talks I'm giving, you might start noticing that when you communicate, you are more instantaneously sharing the image of your inner realms rather than in some sense <clears throat> the delayed theatrics of uh, a, a certain structured communication that means there are some people who speak like uh, in some sense through a sort of pre-designed structure and there are some people who their mind is like a hidden film you know theater and in some sense as they see the film they just communicate Thomas Fuller says, absence sharpens love, presence strengthens it. John Lennon says, love is the flower you've got to let grow. Bertrand Russell says, to fear love is to fear life, and those who fear life are already three parts dead. The Buddha says you can, you can search throughout the entire universe for someone who is more deserving of your love and affection than you are yourself. And that person is not to be found anywhere. You yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. This would mean a total acceptance. <clears throat> that means whatever is, is. And it's, it's like a sort of existential honor of what is. Ovid says, if you want to be loved, be lovable. Voltaire says, love is a canvas furnished by nature and embroidered by imagination. <coughs> Paulo Coelho, one is loved because one is loved. No reason is needed for loving. Jacques Yves Cousteau says people protect what they love. Eric Fromm says love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Yeah, because our psychology in some sense is not trying to be complex. It's actually simple because the brain knows that whatever decision is, is made in reality, energy just keeps going on and changing, right? Even in through a scientific uh, a physics angle, we, we say energy cannot be created or destroyed. What does that mean? That means energy never dies, it transforms. Now, if we were to make consciousness a sort of energy, it would be an energy that is ne that cannot be created or destroyed, so it just transforms. Therefore, all the yogis and Buddhists can suddenly relax, <clears throat> you know, in their certainty. Because what it means is change goes forth and imagine you are loving reality as a body. You are loving reality as a mind and you're loving reality as the soul which is the grand witness of all that occurs. That means cause and effect are, children of, are like the children or are like the wings, are like the wings of a bird. Do you know? <clears throat> and so this bird, the moment it realizes both wings are from it, then it can rhythmically, sing, uh, symmetrically fly in the inner realms.
I think all human beings have a reception and expression threshold. Concepts I created to demonstrate that human beings throughout the day have to express a certain amount and have to receive a certain amount. Now, what tends to happen, I think, in just general psychology is that we tend to find, like, what are the options? We imagine we're just a creature seeking information, but new information. So how we access new information is by constantly going towards what is animate. That means like a huge revelation for the marketing industry, suddenly realizing human beings are going towards the new. And so the greatest marketing is one that is in some sense has envisioned a better future. Can you imagine in, in like less than 100 years, all the products being created by all the companies on the planet are by law mandated to be the most advanced, highest quality, you know, the most efficient thing as if we are tourists here in this life and all the institutions here to, to attend to the service of humanity are like creating like a great tourist experience. Right, so government is like the tour guide, the citizens are like the tourists, you know. <clears throat> the vacation is being a temporary creature on earth, so highest quality, maximum, not maximum ignorant output, but in a sort of output where the, in accordance to the grandness of the quality, you know, as if imagine somebody was a store owner and suddenly they said an alien is going to come to your store tomorrow, an actual extraterrestrial, so you would try to set up you the most advanced possibility of what you have. Now then, when it comes to the inner realm, we are sit standing in the office of our mind. We are standing in a sort of space where we have positioned like furniture, belief systems upon actual objects which are empty in nature. You know, that means two people can look at the same artwork and one of them could be like, that's beautiful, and another one could be like, that's disgusting, you know? <laughs> Do you know, so they could both look at the same artwork and like a light beam hitting it, one on one light beam goes through the idea, through the artwork, and one light beam reflects off. One person doesn't, is rejected by the art, you know, by the geometry of the art, and others are not. You know, Papaji made this clear in an incredible sermon he gave. Papaji, somebody came and told him, why is it that not everybody can get it? Not, not that everybody cannot get enlightened, but the person was saying, why is it that some people are kind of lost in some sort of limbo state in life? <clears throat> like, why is that taking place, you know? Why are there purgatory side effects in the outer realms? And a huge reason for that, personally, I would say, is that we're living too slow as a species. You know, when time moves faster than the free will, you know, the identity, the ego, will feel as if like a titan has ran past the time and the chains, a chain connected to the titan has, has uh, got stuck to uh, the feet of the species and the species is being pulled by time into the unknown, you know, beyond its control. The mind is a force, and what it, what and any management of any force can be seen as a sort of technology. <clears throat> you know that means we have reached an era where, for the first time, eight billion human beings are being requested to become inner managers, to become human conscious of the faculty of their intelligence, and to recognize that because no one like them has ever existed, they are the first. You are the you are the seeker of the truths of the world. As if every person's brain again is like this antenna metaphor and they're receiving a vision 
that only they can receive and if they care and love the species they will try to share as much information with the species uh, you know uh, you know to in some sense allow the species to get to a point where it has made enough backup systems <clears throat> to not be broken that means man's man's solution like I personally <clears throat> in my work have uh, suggested a strategy to bypass extinction indefinitely And you know, I think love is, in, in some sense, it is really karma as well. In yoga, they would say there's four types. <clears throat> that means there are like four states and love is not, love is not, love is like one of them, you know. <clears throat> and I'll give you the, uh, tell you what these four types of yoga was. There was one that was called Raja Yoga. This is in the Bhagavad Gita. And the Raja Yoga is the yoga of work. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Raja Yoga is the yoga of knowledge, not work, knowledge. Karma Yoga is the yoga of work. Bhakti Yoga is the yoga of love. I'm not kidding, like literally it's the yoga of love. And then we have, uh, oh my God, what was it called? Jen Jenna, um, Jenna Yoga. I'm not sure exactly about the name, but this was a type of yoga where it was through certain specific spiritual practices. It had to do with a sort of complex ancient uh, ceremonial attitude towards reality, right? So that was a type of yoga not for everyone, you know? But they would always say that the bhakti yoga, the one who, who was engaged in the yoga of life, uh, uh, love or as the Buddha would say everybody has a Dharma Dharma is like what's happening as you right now in accordance to all that has happened so far in the universe <clears throat> and Dharma means your film pretty much you know the resolution of your film To be free and then to live. That way there is no absence of vision. I'll continue with the quote on all. Samuel Johnson. Love is the wisdom of the fool and the folly of the wise. <coughs> Victor Hugo says to love another person is to see the face of God oh my god you know Victor Hugo is seeing the face of God you know? imagine writing that in your writer's resume you know? <laughs> it's like why was this person late to work he was seeing the face of God you know in his wife, you know. <laughs> Albert Hubbard says the love we give away is the only love we keep. <clears throat> yeah, because any time a person gives, they are considering that they have their reality has is, has managed, you know. <clears throat> uh, there's a person named Bothius. <laughs> He says, who would give a law to lovers? Love is unto itself a higher law. Okay, that's a nice quote. Uh, uh, Honor de Balzac says, love is the poetry of the senses. Princess Diana says, if you find someone you love in your life, then hang on to that love. Oscar Wilde says, who being loved is poor. Buddha says, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. Yeah, I read that. Catherine Deneuve says, love is suffering. One side always loves more. 
<clears throat> that's conditional love. You know, conditional love is image-based. That means if the image changes, it's as if, oh, the love is gone, you know. But unconditional love would mean a care for the victory of the soul of the other, you know, whether it's a species or whether it's an individual or whether it's, like, the galaxy or whatever, you know. Blaise Pascal says, love has reasons which reason cannot understand. <clears throat> Sarah Bernhardt says, your words are my food, your breath my wine, you are everything to me. Okay, okay. <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh says, I feel that there is nothing more truly artistic than to love. St. Augustine says, love is the beauty of the soul. Yeah, that's a great quote. I think I'll end it off here, guys. Or actually, Thomas Aquinas says, love takes up where knowledge leaves off. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, if I was to pilot back to what I was saying earlier, the yoga of love, as one mystic defined it, is like God coming directly and holding the hand of the individual and taking them to truth. You know? The Raja Yogi was in some sense a scholar, a sort of information processor as a sort of the lifetime, as if the person lived as an information processor. <laughs> you know? And so in that search through knowledge, the person is actually not getting enlightened through the heart, the person is getting enlightened through the eyes, you know? <clears throat> Which is Raja Yoga. Karma yoga was in some sense what is happening as the moment. That means when a person comes to look at their karma, they're like, wait a minute, my karma is happening in a, in a society where the karma of others is happening. My karma is happening in a world on a, on a planet where the planet has a sort of karma. My uh, you know, karma is happening simultaneously where the whole universe has a karma. So at some point, the person's like, whose karma is it anyway? <laughs> So the karma yogi is fascinated by the existential condition, but not just limited to the sensory realism, you know. That means physicists would in some sense be raja yogis, you know. Those in the performer's realm, you know, in the realm of expressing into the world, they in some sense are found in to be karma yogis in the sense that they are trying to find the cause of truth. Because all that karma means is that there was a cause beforehand. That's what I mean. That means if someone is suffering right now, something has, has happened in the past, you know, whatever result the person has, it connects to how the past sculpted uh, the road ahead, really. And you know, there is this idea that we fall in love. I would say falling in love is for society and culture, for secular culture. I would say for non-secular culture, any sort of metaphysical, multidimensional view, it is in some sense, love is in some sense arising. It is flight. It is the mind uh, aiming for completion, but not a completion that is conditional. <coughs> You know, as if, as if in some sense, the, when uh, King Arthur was about to pull the sword from the stone, the whole universe paused, and it was as if a private moment where he recognized as if he had tapped into a destiny checkpoint. <laughs> Anyways. <coughs> There's so much more to say about this topic and uh, I feel that the species is maturing to a point where collective love is the only outcome. In the trenches of the language wars 
and in an era where the creature has uh, consumed so much information that the creature is like what now you know that's the hilarious thing about uh, outer realm success that the moment you reach the top you realize in some sense that with a, it's just the beginning that that means there is so many things that can update that it's as if the all of the world problems who know is not because we're greedy careless it's all financial mismanagement it's mis resource allocation and it is um, conflicting uh, world visions right so the challenge of actually <clears throat> like even the United Nations I don't understand why they don't have a philosophy department they have to have a philosophy department where the ideologies that all world leaders are functioning under are taken into consideration towards the potential of a of, of a peaceful global future right so it's as if sometimes I find in these peace conference what are they talking about right and I realize it's as if they're talking about like planting trees and all this stuff and I'm like how precious what really should the civilization be focused on planting trees or should the civilization be focused on in some sense preparing for the arrival it's literally like our technology after the year 2050 is it may expand in such a way where it's as if like an alien has landed Landed down, even though aliens might not have landed or uh, uh, been presented, but it would be something where I would say that it's just being overwhelmed by a higher intelligence. doesn't exist if it's changing all the time. In the ashes of still the animalistic residue of the cruelty of man found in society, our only retaliation <coughs> is to respond from a higher resonance. cultivating their own space of mind and you know there is no death if we are energy so to meditate on how we are an energetic being present in the realm how our intelligence creates boundaries how the geometry of the moment speaks to us and how in the moment we are called forth right because after a person has uh, activated a certain amount of skill in their inner realms the inner realms pushes the person towards the outer realms that means what happens is when the mind finds a state that is worthy of like it finds like <coughs> king arthur's sword right like you have a king arthur sword moment you know where you're just uh, you're just you, you it's literally like linking your past present future into one moment and then linking that moment to the next moment anyways guys um, <clears throat> love your world simply because you're in it once you know because ultimately we're just creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere and our best strategy has to come through our communication advancing so that we create a global network where all the greatest ideas from all over the planet are finding themselves in like a gladiator arena where <clears throat> you know the enlightened societies of the world will in some sense try to polish out the to try to find the worthiest ideas and in some sense we pretty much create a ridiculous global feedback loop 
Right, and the civilization updates, 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 gets to a point where it becomes a sort of incredible advanced human awareness to technological positioning. That means it's as if what is the best preparation if in like 40 years or 50 years technology is going to become uncontrollable or maybe extraterrestrials land or whatever. It's like, what's, what are we going to do as a species? And our best mental retaliation is, is to observe silence and become content with the unknown. That means whatever happens, it's as if the unknown has been watched before. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Much blessings. And, uh, <clears throat> I think um, in three more episodes and then it's got the live streams are going to just be presented to members. And um, And honestly, I'm telling you, something has to happen. There's no, you know what it is? It's like, it's like 8 billion people who came to the party and now we're like, where's the music, right? And the music is like the intellectual rhythm of a species towards its own advanced survival. That means we don't want just the body to survive. You know, as we go, uh, as we climb Maslow's hierarchy, uh, of sociological needs, let's say, you know, <clears throat> um, as we climb that hierarchy, we reach a certain point where we reach self-actualization. But in order to be your, for yourself to be actualized, you're going to notice your collective self is everything. So how everything is happening becomes your identity, not in the sense that you, not in the sense that you are you are having an eye being a certain idea in accordance to everything. How do I say it? I'm, I'm just saying that when there is a universal identity, <clears throat> right, the, the shackles of um, uh, uh, and, and the story of a person kind of break. And I, f I feel from that raw vision, you know, one in some sense is in the proper state to advance civilization. Anyways. <clears throat> Love is how truth, or uh, I would say love is uh, truth's uh, mirror. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Awesome.